Today's story takes place in Jacksonville, Florida, USA. Located on the Atlantic coast of northeastern Florida, Jacksonville is known for its hot summers, picturesque shores, and now, unfortunately, today's story. Tristan Bailey was born here in Durban, St. John's County on 18 January 2009. She was family-oriented, bright and lovable. She was a student and cheerleader at Patriot Oaks Academy. She was the daughter of loving parents Forrest and Stacy Bailey and the youngest of her four siblings. The Baileys were a tight-knit family and referred to themselves lovingly as the Bailey Seven. On the 8th of May, the Bailey family went out for dinner and visited one of their adult daughters. They arrived back at home at around 11.45 p.m. and all went to bed around midnight. They had a semi-eventful day ahead as it was Mother's Day the next day and the family intended on spending it together as they always did. At 9.40 a.m. on the 9th of May, Tristan's siblings went to wake her up as they were all planning on preparing a special Mother's Day breakfast for their mom. That's when they discovered that Tristan was not in her bedroom. The family searched the entire house and the immediate area for Tristan with no luck. By 10 a.m., Stacy Bailey, Tristan's mom, called 911. Stacy was already frantic and requested for an officer to come over as she had a missing daughter. She gave a description of Tristan, 13 years old, approximately 5 feet and 4 inches tall, around 130 pounds. Tristan's cell phone was not in her room, and when they tried to ring it, it went straight to voicemail. The dispatcher asked Stacy to search the entire house once more, while on the phone. With no luck, Stacy further went on to explain that Tristan did not seem upset when saying goodnight to them, but had definitely developed a standoffish attitude and spent a lot of time in her room lately, all which could be considered typical teenage behavior. She was last seen wearing a white sheer shirt and dark shorts. Tristan's sister also mentioned that she had seen her doing a video chat at around midnight with an unknown Caucasian boy wearing a backwards white baseball cap. The police ordered a ping order for Tristan's cell phone to attempt to locate the device's geographical location, hoping that she would be near her cell phone. Phone records showed that Tristan received a call from a number at 12.25 a.m. on 9 May. The caller was identified as Aiden Fucci. Surveillance footage from a neighbor clearly showed Tristan sneaking out of her home. Police obtained surveillance video from the Durban Crossing North Amnity Center. It showed two subjects walking past the main entrance along the sidewalk at 1.24 a.m. More surveillance video that was obtained by detectives from a neighborhood resident showed that at 1.45 a.m. the same two subjects walking east on the sidewalk of Saddlestone Drive towards the pond. They could make out that one of the subjects was wearing a light-colored hooded sweatshirt and a pair of white Nike sneakers. The second subject was significantly shorter and was wearing a light shirt and black shorts. But at 3.27 a.m. the surveillance footage showed one subject walking west away from the pond, still wearing his light hooded sweatshirt but now carrying his white Nike sneakers in his hands. The authorities found out that Tristan had snuck out to hang out at Trey Absher's house. Deputy Robert Maloney and Deputy Liam Stack interviewed Trey. Trey confirms that Tristan arrived at his house at 12.30 a.m. on 9 May. He recalls Tristan sneaking around the north side of his house to avoid the security cameras at his residence. Also hanging out with them was 14-year-old Aiden Fucci, who also lived in the neighborhood. He said that Tristan and Aiden had left his home at 1 a.m. together and as far as he was concerned, they were both going back to their own homes. Police decided to track down Aiden Fucci. Police interview Aiden Fucci at his home in Castledale Court on the afternoon of Sunday, 9 May 2021. With his parents' consent, Fucci went with them down to the station to be further interviewed by police. Fucci told his side of the story, stating that he had indeed left with Tristan from Trey's house, and they walked together to North Durban Parkway. After that, he said Tristan turned onto Cloister Bain Drive to go back to her house, and that he then walked along North Durban Parkway and arrived home between 3 and 3.30 a.m. 
This immediately sounded suspicious to deputies, as they wanted to know how it could take Aiden two hours to walk home from Trey's house to his. The distance was 1.4 miles, which would work out to approximately a 28 minute walk. But then Aiden Fucci would change his story, now stating that he and Tristan continued walking north along North Durban Parkway and got into an altercation. He said they kissed and then Tristan grabbed his penis. He claims that when she did that, he pushed her and she fell on the ground and hit her head. According to Aiden, this occurred near the 600 block of North Durban Parkway, north of Leith Hall Drive. Aiden added that he could not recall if Tristan got up after that, as he himself felt dizzy from all the marijuana he had smoked at Trey's house. Aiden Fucci then went on to suggest that Tristan might just be with her drug dealer, who was in his 20s, that she communicated with through Snapchat. This all sounded very strange and suspicious to police. Not only did he change his story, but it wasn't making any sense. From their research on Tristan, nothing suggested that this girl would be involved with drug dealers, and based on Aiden's statements, Deputy Maloney had a feeling that a crime may have occurred. He read Aiden his constitutional rights. Aiden Fucci invoked his rights and declined to provide any further information. He was then returned to the North Amity Centre, at which time Fucci and his parents requested an attorney. But what has left many infuriated and speechless is what this teen did next. It's in a f cop car, guys. She's tripping, dude. Oh, it's all right on this. Oh my god. <laughs> Damn, dude has like flashbangs and back there. We're, we're having fun in a f cop car. Yep. Tristan. What's up, guys? Yep. Tristan, if you f walk out the damn. When you see this in a month. Police caught wind of the Snapchat video created by Aiden with a text banner saying, Hey guys, has anyone seen Tristan lately? And they were especially interested in what people commented on it, with one person saying, WTF Aiden, and another, you were with her Aiden. Aiden's phone was then seized as it contained possible evidence related to the investigation. Additionally, this just showed Aiden's level of maturity and lack of respect for the seriousness of the matter. At 4.50pm, Sergeant Thomas Marmo from the Special Victims Unit requested a missing child alert for Tristan. The search was on. At 5.15pm, detectives canvassed Cloister Bain Drive for possible witnesses. And at 6.06pm, the Sheriff's Office received a call from Daniel Hart, who advised he located what appeared to be a deceased female. Ten minutes later, police arrived at the scene. The deceased female was 13-year-old Tristan Bailey. Tristan was located in a wooded area approximately 80 feet from the southernmost retention pond south of the Durban Creek Nursery, located at 4286 Racetrack Road. Her hair appeared to be red in colour from all the blood. She had multiple sharp force injury wounds on her hands, arms, neck and appeared to have additional sharp force trauma injuries to her back, evident by the holes in her shirt. In the immediate vicinity, crime scene technician Marilyn Butts located a gold-toned ring, a cell phone later identified as Tristan's phone, a $20 bill and a pink vape device. Butts advised she located a possible shoe impression within the wooded area, as well as a Powerade bottle near the pond. She collected the cell phone after processing the scene, which was later transferred to forensics to be processed. Once the autopsy was completed, it was confirmed that Tristan was stabbed a total of 114 times, where 49 of them were defensive, meaning that Tristan had fought for her life. At 8pm, Aiden was transported to the SJSO Central Investigations Division. While conducting a pat-down for weapons of Aiden, Deputy Maloney found a blue-handled folding knife. The knife was inspected, but there was nothing suspicious about it, and it was turned over to Aiden's dad, Jason Fucci. At 8.49 p.m., Aiden was taken to CID and placed in interview room 2, which was both audio and video recorded. His parents, Jason and Crystal, were present in the room with him. Without knowing their discussion was being recorded, the parents had a lot of advice and comments about what Aiden should do and say. They asked their son about the incident, but Aiden denied killing Tristan. His parents also asked him why he was wet, when he came home and why he was carrying his shoes on the surveillance video. 
Aiden explained that he took his shoes off because they were hurting his feet, and he was wet because he fell. It almost seemed like Aiden's parents wanted the truth from him, but they didn't necessarily want the police to know the truth. At 8.59pm, Detective Thompson entered the room and asked for DNA swab, photographs and fingernail scrapings from Aiden, but his mom Crystal advised that they were going to wait for the attorney to arrive before they allow any of that to happen. Authorities also speak to Aiden's girlfriend, Sophie. Sophie mentioned that Aiden struggled at home. Aiden would confide in Sophie and tell her that his mom would tell him that he was a disappointment and he felt neglected by both parents. He shared a lot of his thoughts and desires with her. Sophie said Aiden had anger issues, that he said he sometimes did things that he didn't want to do when he got angry and that she had seen him get violent with people, but she never believed he was capable of murder. Aiden was into evil, satanic and violent type of drawings. He would draw them himself or would even ask others to draw it for him. Sophie also mentioned that Aiden once told her that he sometimes heard voices in his head that told him to do things. Sophie also admitted that he would talk about killing people a lot, but she never took it seriously. Reportedly, Aiden also mentioned that he even had thoughts of killing Sophie, going as far as pretending to stab her with his knife. The most compelling part was where Sophie mentioned that Aiden had told her that he would find a random person and walk with them at night, take them to the woods and stab them to death, and that she could expect that to happen within the next month. But Sophie still mentioned it was not like Aiden to kill anyone. Authorities were busy gathering evidence to prove that Aiden Fucci murdered Tristan Bailey, but they felt they might not have enough to charge him with murder. Police found out that Aiden had an obsession with knives and would always carry two on him. He even gave them names. He called one picker and the other poker. The murder weapon was then found in the pond, close to where they found Tristan's body, and the tip of the knife was found in Tristan's head. With everything authorities have learned, they obtained a warrant to search the Fuji's home. They found the white Nikes that Aiden had attempted to hide in his house, and they tested positive for blood. They also found a damp shirt and jeans in a washing basket in his bathroom that also tested positive for blood. It was now very apparent that Tristan didn't just disappear or run off with some drug dealer, as Aiden suggested, but he was directly involved with her murder. Aiden Fuji was arrested and charged with murder and was set to be tried as an adult and would be facing up to 40 years to life in prison. Another surprising turn of events was that Aiden wasn't the only one in his family facing charges. From their own home surveillance system, detectives discovered that after Aiden was questioned the first time, Crystal, his mom, went up to his bedroom and found the jeans Aiden had worn the night of Tristan's murder. She saw that the jeans had blood on them, and she is seen on the surveillance footage scrubbing the jeans in the bathroom sink, so she was charged for tampering with evidence. Nearly two years after Tristan's murder, Aiden Fucci was set to go on trial. However, as jury selection was about to begin, Aiden's lawyer announced that he would be entering a plea of guilty for one count of first-degree murder. Aiden avoided the death penalty because he was a juvenile and showed a sudden sense of remorse. Most believe this was just an act to receive a lesser sentence than life imprisonment. Most felt that the Bailey family would be relieved to not go through the process of a trial, but in an interview they said that they had already mentally prepared for it. Prosecutors were pushing for a life sentence, claiming that even though Aiden was a juvenile, the brutality of Tristan's murder could not be overlooked. She had 114 stab wounds and Aiden Fucci's actions after the murder were simply disgusting. From the Snapchat videos to the lying and to the lack of remorse, prosecutors felt that a life sentence was well deserved. A clinical psychologist also took the stand in Aiden's sentencing hearing and said that Aiden was a very unique person and that his behavior and actions were alarmingly unusual for a 14-year-old and that he was demonstrating behaviors that were clinically concerning. The psychologist also said that his prognosis was poor for future rehabilitation. Aiden's defense argues that he was not mentally well and extremely immature for his age and that affected his ability to make sound decisions. His attorneys also called another psychologist to the stand who claimed that he believed Aiden could be rehabilitated in the future. The first time Aiden showed any emotion was when his grandmother took the stand. 
His grandmother also addressed the Baileys and apologized for the loss of their daughter at the hands of her grandson. The Baileys later stated that even though they were in so much pain, they could feel her pain too and really appreciated the apology they received from her as it was the first they had received. The Baileys received a very simplistic apology letter from Aidan Fucci that read in part, I'm sorry that you didn't get to know her that long. Before Aidan received his sentence, the Bailey family had an opportunity to speak. The judge said that this crime had no motive and was done for no other reason than to satisfy Aidan's internal desire to feel what it would be like to kill someone and sentence Aidan to life in prison, eligible for review of the sentence in 25 years. It was the maximum sentence that a judge could have given a juvenile. The Bailey family said that they were satisfied with the sentence, but realized that they would have to prepare for what may come their way in 25 years when Aidan's sentence is reviewed. Crystal, Aidan Fucci's mother, still had to await her sentencing. She was charged with tampering with evidence, a third-degree felony. Crystal entered a plea agreement and received a sentence of a month behind bars and five years of probation. The Baileys started the Tristan Bailey Memorial Fund to help families that go through horrific experiences like they have. I will leave a link in the description to the Tristan Bailey Memorial Fund for anyone to donate should they wish to do so. Recent reports have stated that Aidan Fucci, now 16 years old, has been threatening officers and menacing and extorting other teen inmates at the Duval County Jail. According to several incident reports, Aidan is combative, a bully, and is constantly in fights with other inmates. If he continues on this path, he will never see the light of day again. That's the end of today's harrowing story. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe. Until next week, stay safe.